Minuet in G, Johann Sebastian Bach. And a very well-known piece by Bach. Um, most piano students learn how to play this piece at some point. Um, a lot of fun to play. A very singable, identifiable melody. And I'd like to break it down into its simplest elements today. I want to talk about how Bach was a master at implying chord shapes with only two notes. And it's a lot of fun to do. It's a, it's a great sound. And what I'm saying is there are full chords sometimes in the, in the piece. In fact, the very first thing we get is a G major chord. So G, B, D, all right? But I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna play the full chords. I'm just gonna play the bottom notes and the melody notes. And let's see how we can hear what the actual harmonies are implied. By the way, a side note. Uh, on the performance section of this video, I played this on with a, harp, a harpsichord sound. Because back in Bach's time, um, the piano, as we know it today, wasn't even invented yet. The, the keyboard instrument of the day was, was a harpsichord. So I thought it would be fun just to kind of uh, pay tribute to that uh, sound and see what it might have sounded like back then. Um, these days, it's usually performed on piano. Okay, here we go. Let's start. get started. That's the first measure. We're clearly implying a G major chord here with just a G and a D. That's an A minor to my ears. That B to C in the right hand with an A on the bottom. G over B. I think because there we're emphasizing the G. Right, so it's clearly G over B. Okay, let's keep going. We just have two notes there, E and C. It's a C major chord. G major. So what have we done so far? We've gone from the one chord to the two chord to the four chord and back. And that, and that two chord thing was really just a passing movement so honestly, in its simplest form, it could really just be two chords, G and C. You see that? But those little movements, especially in the, in the bottom part, uh, you know, that really, it gives the piece movement forward. You know, you're climbing up and uh, it makes it more interesting, in my opinion. Okay, let's keep going. Clearly A minor there with A and C. Back to G. Here's where it gets a little interesting. D and F sharp, clearly a D chord. See that? He went D, B, G. And that, so we get the D chord, G over B, G. And that, okay, is, is to me a D7 chord. Because you have an A and a D, and then C, B, A. There's no F sharp in it, but I don't think it needed F sharp to, to sound like D. All right, we have a recap of the main theme in the right hand, but the harmonies are a little bit different in the voicings for the left. So we have G over B. quick G over B thing there. C, G over B again. So that little part, he's borrowing it from that thing that he did at the end of the first theme. Um, walking down the scale from C, B, A, G. Now, A minor. That to me is D over F sharp, okay? I, I, right, so he's got an F sharp in, in the bass, B, A, right? So, G, 
G over B. Now, this is interesting because it's an interval of a sixth, right? So C and A. Now, you could look at that a couple of different ways. You could say, well, it's just a C chord with the sixth in the melody. That's true. It's probably what he was thinking. And then to a D chord. But what's it, it, it could be this. It could be it's like it's four, five, one. All right, could be the resolve. Could also be this though. It could be like two five one, A minor, D, G. But the two would be in first inversion. A minor would have C on the bottom, with A on top. Right, and then D seven sus four, D. So a couple of these things I think are open to interpretation, in particular that C and A. You could look at it, you know, a couple of different ways, and I don't think either way is wrong. You know, I think they're both right. That's the first page of the piece. Let's go on to the second. So we're starting up here on G, and this is a classic chord progression that we're going to do right here that's been used in so many different songs, so many different styles of music. I love it. It's one of my favorite things. Um, we're just going to descend the major scale from the root, seventh, to the relative minor, E minor. Notice we haven't done any relative minor yet in the piece. So, right. So I'm thinking of that as G major, and then D over F sharp. There's no D there, right? But now there is. Right? So. E minor all the way. Now this is so typical in box music where all of a sudden we'll go to the do, uh, two major chord in order to set up some time uh, for it to function as the five chord of the five chord. I, all right, bear with me. I know that's a lot. So we've been in G major the whole time, right? So it, let's do the second section again. So that A chord comes out of nowhere. We're going to stay on it for a minute. I love this part. All those things with just two voices, right? One in the right, one in the left, and all that harmonic movement. It's really exciting. So, uh, to me, um, we've climbed up the A scale, right? So, uh, G over B, D, A over C sharp, D, D over F sharp, A, D, and then D7. So you see how that, what I said, with the two chord being major, it acts as the five chord. Five down from A is D, right? Okay, so, and D in the key of G is the five chord of G, right? So we had the five of five. I mean, that's a common harmonic movement in, in all music. Uh, you just may not be aware of what it actually is, but you surely would recognize the sound. Okay, we were on what amounts to a D7. Okay, G over B again. All right, C. G over B, A minor, G, D. And now we're on that five chord. We're gonna stay on it, we're gonna climb up, and this is the, like the climax of the piece. So even though that climb with the F sharp, you think, okay, he's gonna go to a G. No, watch what he does. I absolutely love that. We got a C in the right hand and an E in the left hand. It's C over E. So he went from the five chord to the four chord but in first inversion for the four chord. So we had this, 
going to this. And it's just such a, a pull harmonically, you know, for your ear to be interested in that. So, all right, one more time. G, D, G over B, D, G. And that's it. That's, that's the whole piece. Notice, right, there wasn't much uh, in terms of the amount of chords going on, but yet uh, and there wasn't really much cr chromaticism at all. I mean, you had one note outside of the G major scale, which was the C sharp, which was only passing for two measures there, all right? Everything else was diatonic to the key of G. So it's amazing how much musical mileage Bach could get out of staying in a major scale. I mean, he was the absolute master at that. I mean, there's so many great songs that, you know, are diatonic. It's great. But you see, even with all that, I mean, this is a regarded as a fairly easy piece, but I mean, if you really dig into it, I mean, there's quite a bit happening with just a handful of chords. So one of the takeaways I would sometimes recommend with this is, especially if you're a piano player, right? Um, used to playing a lot of notes, right? You got two hands, you got, you got, you got 10 fingers, right? Mm -hmm. You can play as many as 10 notes. Try two, right? I mean, so many things that you could do just by doing root and third. You know? simple exercise but you know you take that it changes the way you would normally think about sitting down and writing a song because it, when you when you take away stuff and you only have a few things to work with your brain functions differently it thinks differently right because you, you're not limited to or I should say you're not um, handcuffed by all the tricks that you already know you have to kind of think a little harder to see what really sounds best. And I've said it before, simple is not easy. And while it's a simple concept, to come up with something that really sounds good would be more of a task. Worth checking out. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's breakdown. If you did, please consider subscribing to my channel for more videos like this to come. And thank you for watching.